Welcome everyone. My name is Rachel Bowen Pittman. I am the Executive Director of the United Nations Association of the USA, also known as UNA USA. And I'm so honored to be here today with three incredible women to have a conversation about gender-based violence. And today with me, we have Angelina Jolie, who is a special envoy for the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, or UNHCR. We have Representative Chrissy Houlihan from Pennsylvania's 6th District. And we also have Dr. Natalia Kanem, uh, Executive Director of the United Nations Populations Fund, UNFPA. These incredible leaders are advocating for gender equality and working with the United Nations, the United States Congress, and the global community to call attention to gender-based violence, also known as GBB. So let's just jump right into it. Uh, I want to start with Special Envoy Jolie. You know, you are one of the world's leading advocates for refugees and displaced persons, and you have been on 60 field missions. And I know that recently you saw UNFPA's work up close in Bangladesh. What have you seen out in the field that makes you want to address gender-based violence? I don't think I've been on, I know I haven't been on one mission to one country where I haven't met victims of sexual and gender-based violence. And I can tell you that the, from the, the first time I met a little girl rocking and, and crying and, and, uh, and it was explained to me what had happened to her and what she saw, um, it's such a horror. It's everywhere. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is true that over, we, we know this, a hundred and uh, you know thirty seven women a day die at the hands of of an intimate partner, so it's not just far, far away in a refugee camp or somewhere else. it is domestic, it is global, there is very little uh, work to uh, to hold those accountable for these crimes. Almost every victim I met, you ask them what they need, and they say, "Please justice." Um, and they rarely get it. And Representative Holohan, you have you know, a really impressive um, profile and background. Yeah, at, in your career, you were an Air Force veteran, an engineer, an entrepreneur, an educator, and now you're serving as the first female representative for Pennsylvania's 6th District in Congress. And you also currently serve on the Foreign Affairs Committee. Can you explain why GBV is a foreign policy issue? I, I guess what I would have to say is that I not only serve on the Armed Services Committee, but I also serve on the, uh, I'm sorry, on the Foreign Affairs Committee, but I also serve on the Armed Services Committee. Mm -hmm. And so those two um, intersections of, of our humanitarian uh, policy, our diplomatic policy, and then our defense posture and policy uh, are really interrelated. And so I want to emphasize some of the really lovely things that Special Envoy Jolie said, which is that it is all about the individual child and the individual woman and mother uh, and the individual family and community, but it is also about the overall overarching security of that community, security of that nation state, uh, and then security, therefore, of our, of our planet. Uh, we know that research shows that there's a higher level, that higher levels of gender equality are associated with lower propensity for conflict, uh, both within a nation and communities and uh, with between nations and communities. And so we know that data from countries around the world demonstrate that when women are included, when they are safe, uh, first and foremost, and when they are then included in things like peacekeeping units, police uh, forces and the security sector, that uh, security and peace is improved. And so it's at the individual child and, and woman level, uh, but it's also at the overall you know, planet and our, and our security and safety level. And I know that what we do on the front end with our humanitarian outreach, with our diplomatic outreach will pay back over and over and over again with what we have to do from a security perspective. And I wish there were more people in Congress who had that purview. Uh, there are very, very few who sit on both of those committees. And that also speaks of why we need more women in leadership so that they can have a voice for women when developing these policies. So thank you. You're welcome. Dr. Kanan, uh, you are the executive director of UNFPA, the UN Sexual and Reproductive Health Agency. And your agency takes a lead in addressing and preventing gender-based violence. As a medical doctor, you've seen issues close up. Um, can you share an experience 
uh, or a moment that speaks to you and makes you want to continue to advocate and fight against gender-based violence? Thank you, Rachel, for having me. And I do have to say how honored I feel to be here with the representative and the special envoy and uh, echoing what you've just said about women's leadership and the courageous leadership that it takes to stand up for people who otherwise might not be heard. So very happy to be here. I could list so many instances of why it is that I personally am committed to this issue and why UNFPA has taken bold steps to make sure that even in the middle of a COVID pandemic, we don't forget the responsibilities that we have. And I'll give you a couple of vignettes, um, one from Iraq, where actually with uh, funding support from the United States, we began a GBV survivors unit. This was around the time uh, when uh, in particular Yazidi women were coming out uh, and the uh, issues in Iraq were really, really grave. By 2019, three years later, we had seen well over 1300 women, individuals who had been harmed by sexual and gender-based violence. Some of them trafficked. The terminology they used was sold into slavery. Now, this is something that really shakes me to my core. And, you know, it's as, um, it's as you're sitting in a circle with someone and you have to face them and they believe that as a representative of the United Nations, um, that you have the power to assist them. Mm -hmm. You will knock down every barrier that you can to be sure that what we do is effective. Speaking for UNFPA, I think the safe spaces, and I've sat in these circles in so many places now, give a respite to women, to girls sometimes, who otherwise just wouldn't really know uh, a moment of peace. But the equation of justice, which um, uh, has already been spoken to, is one where the world needs to pay much more attention and where we have to make sure that we involve survivors in the discussion of what peace and security truly is. Very proud that the Secretary General this year saw fit to issue a declaration calling for peace in the home. And by this, he means a ceasefire on the type of disrespect that can be lethal at its extreme. But even if it doesn't kill you, you know, like one, a young girl said to me, you die every minute. So a day is like a lifetime. Can you talk a little bit more about COVID-19 and its impact and what, how UNFPA is responding? So with COVID, we have been uh, sounding the alarm of the catastrophe that it's been when mobility is restricted, mm -hmm. communication is restricted, People cannot report or say what's happening. And of course, there are literally millions of schoolgirls who have not been going into a place, which for many can be a place of safety. So as UNFPA has analyzed the potential for an additional 31 million cases of GBV for every six months of a lockdown, this is why I'm really proud to be with the type of leadership represented on this panel who are willing to act. And if I could interject a little, and that's where the United States and, and where my role and my part of the government really should be taking a part. You know, we, uh, the United States, as the United States have really abdicated our responsibility and the role that we have to play and the voice that we have uh, with helping organizations like UNFPA, which is why in, you know, in my capacity as a representative of my community and my country, we have introduced legislation to make sure that the U.S. is playing an active role uh, in these conversations 
conversations. And as the special envoy also said, this is not just restricted to refugee camps. This is happening everywhere in our world. And we, as the United States, as uh, I hope still a global leader, if not the global leader, have a real responsibility to women and girls around the world so that we can have 51% of our population empowered and able to have healthy lives. And also, you know, talking about bringing awareness, special envoy this past July, you had a chance to speak to the UN Security Council about the underfunding of sexual and gender-based violence programs. Can you talk to, little, to, to us a little bit more about you know, what moved you to talk about this issue? You know, when you're, when you're in the field a lot and you work with UN, you, you're often aware of, of where the money goes. You know, you know when there's very little money, you know when there's a 10% ration, you know what that means to the field. You, you understand by percentages sometime what is of value to the Security Council members. And the, there is less than 1% of global humanitarian aid goes to gender-based um, prevention and response, less than 1%. And we know the significance, uh, we know the numbers and we know how significant it is, as the representative said, to security um, you know, we know how significant it is certainly to the life of, of the woman and the girl. We know what it means to their family. We know what it means to the structure of the community and society. There are parts of, of the world where there are whole hospitals, whole hospitals dedicated to fistula. And for those who don't know what that is, that is a rape or a child who is impregnated so young that, that their body tears in the middle and they are leaking. And, and to not, I won't be more graphic, it's, it's uh, but what that, what that is that you have a whole hospital dedicated to it, that we are failing so much globally that, that the solution isn't to stop the rape, to protect the girl, to protect the child, to secure the community, to have the prosecutions. The, the solution seems to be to help to fund the hospitals so people can sew them back together repeatedly, and I've been at these hospitals where the grandmother, the mother, and the child all have been raped, all have been assaulted, and none have justice. So we're in this cycle that if we don't recognize what is happening globally, um, when the women don't realize their value and they don't see that the world around them is willing to hold those to account who assaulted them, when they continue to see those people walk away from it and, and have you know, nothing, absolutely no justice, no nothing, what does that say to them? How do we value them? Do we value them at all? All of these Rohingya women, do they mean anything to us? Does, does justice or accountability for the crimes against their bodies mean anything to us? Mm -hmm. Because our lack of action says everything. And to somebody who's been through violence, you know, they, the, the thing they need the most, what any trauma specialist will tell you, is they need to, it to be acknowledged. They need their value to be acknowledged. So, so yes, there is, there is not enough. Uh, we, we do not put the funding in, in the places that we, we pretend when we say every equal rights and girls matter and things. Uh, we, don't, we don't match it with, with our responses at all. So we need to hold those to account to to show them that they may say it, but they clearly don't mean it. So what do we tell members of Congress or other policy types who argue that, you know, with COVID-19 and the unemployment rate being really high, we don't have, you know, the capacity mm -hmm. to deal with more problems at, at, with everything that's going on at home domestically? You know, what do we, what do we tell members of Congress, Representative Houlihan, what, what do we tell sure. our peers, your peers? This is why it's so important to have um, diversity at the table, to have more women and people of color, to have more engineers, to have more veterans, to have more of everything at the table is to be able to have those hard conversations. And the special envoy talked about how she didn't want to get too graphic, but sometimes you got to get graphic. You know, you've got to bring it to reality uh, with the people who sit at my tables, you know, who sit around me in, in, the, in the halls of Congress. Uh, there's a reason why we call this a global pandemic. It's because it's global. And we have to work together to fight the fact that if it's in one place, it's going to be in our place pretty soon. And so we have um, a responsibility, as, as we were talking about, to uh, call things out, to, to face things 
face on, we also have the ability as one of the strongest nations in the world to care and to have uh, compassion and to be able to think about this global pandemic as, as all of the people around the world are our citizens in a way. Interestingly, on the Senate side of many of these COVID relief, relief packages, surprisingly, there actually has been federal funding uh, for our global response which is surprising if you know the composition, political composition of the Senate. On the House side, only recently has that funding been um, put, put in and, and still not adequately, I would argue. So we do have a responsibility to have more diversity at the table, to have these difficult conversations, to understand our, our global role in the, in the world and to do something. Uh, and that's what I think you get when you get more uh, representative government. And what would you say to your constituents that, or to constituents in general across the U.S., what they should be doing in, when speaking to members of Congress? Recently, you've seen, at least in my community, a real awakening, you know, kind of a real activation of people's uh, cortex in, in the political mind, that they understand that their government really does serve them and work for them, and that if they don't have uh, if they don't vote, they don't have a voice, they don't have a say. So we see right now we're looking at more than 70% will probably show up to vote, which would be pretty astounding. And I'm hoping it will be a lot more. So what I would say is, you know, vote. What I would also say is uh, issues that seem far away are not, you know, uh, I used to teach uh, a school, high school of chemistry down in Philadelphia, 10 miles from here. Uh, people who I talk to in my community don't think that's their issue. It's absolutely their issue. The kids are, who are in Philadelphia are their children. The kids who are, you know, in uh, Osrock are their children. Uh, and I think that people are starting to understand their place in the world. There needs to be a cultural shift where people are more vocal in saying that we're not gonna stand up for this anymore. You know, what are some things that should be done to make that cultural shift where gender-based violence and the, the, the response and prevention of gender-based violence is more prioritized in our communities? If we could have a, a permanent body to, to gather evidence uh, for prosecutions, I think, you know, I, I think, a, when we talk about aid or fundings or appeals or whether we care or not, there are certain things that are right and wrong. And there are certain things that should be um, established to be criminal and, and they need to be, um, you know, we need to find ways to locally as well. So it's not us trying to worry about, or we, we help to bring justice. We help to bring accountability. We help there to be a place where um, we can weigh the evidence and, and we can, we can make the, the direct change on the ground, um, which I think will help stabilize. Um, and absolutely said that involves the men, um, you know, stepping up uh, even more. Um, those who are part of the problem must stop. And those who have already stood up uh, on, in defense of women need to speak up louder. Yeah, I'd love to comment on this too. Could not agree more with everything that's already been said, but, uh, one of the very important discussions that we need to have, and remember it's 75 years of the United Nations, the U United States having been obviously, you know, an important founding member. And uh, for the proposition of the Beijing Women's Conference, it's 25 years this year. And then it's 20 years since the passing of a resolution on women, peace, and security. These are all instruments that, in theory, should be upholding the idea that everyone is equal, and the UN Charter specifies equality between men and women. So why the lag? Why ignoring a crime that is so prevalent? And Rachel, you put the statistic on the table. One in three women affected by physical or sexual violence in her lifetime. So why aren't these things elevated to the critical condition of the patient that the world finds itself in? Well, as we've analyzed, we've seen that gender bias actually begins right there in the cradle. The preference for a boy over a girl is highly prevalent, and it's not just in developing countries, it's everywhere. But dialogue, as the representative said, has to be the starting point. And I like to go back to um, the need for men and boys to be allies 
When we say that to them, what are some actions, specific actions that you think they should be taking in order to be an ally so they know, you know, what are the next steps for them? Some of the best examples I've seen of male allies are teenage boys who get it and they have launched whole discussions around female genital mutilation to say, we don't care whether this procedure is done to a girl or not, and it should stop. Similarly, in sports clubs, we've had movements um, in West Africa. There's one that's called Touche Pas Ma Soeur, Don't Touch My Sister. And it's great to see these guys stepping out there and, and, and making a statement. And the expectation has to be there that everybody steps up. This is an issue that concerns every single person. Can you all talk about you know, some innovations that you have seen that has helped women uh, and, and girls combat uh, gender-based violence and empower them? And are there anything that our listeners should know that they can do now to help curb the spike in GBV? Mm-hmm. And um, Special Envoy, I'd like to start with you of you know, what you've seen out in the field that has empowered women. It's hard because I, we are, there's, there's more, there's, there's more that's been disheartening than, than certainly, you know, it's, it's a very hard road and it's quite shocking what's out there. You know, I don't, we were talking about things to teach people that they may not know. You know, I was, I I was recently made aware. I knew that, that in some countries, a rapist, if he was, if he married the woman he raped, he could, he could get away. He could be exempt from prosecution. I didn't realize it was in 37 countries. So when we have things like this that are a part of, of a country, when, it, when that's a, a rule of law in a country, it, where to begin? Um, of course, I've seen a lot of wonderful, uh, of wonderful us- uh, gatherings and groups. I've seen, I've worked with men in Afghanistan who've helped me build a school for, for girls and have helped protect it themselves, built the wall themselves, defended it themselves for, for a very long time under not easy conditions and currently not very easy, stood to defend uh, the women. I've, I've met men who've been beaten up because they insisted their girls get an education. Um, I've, I've seen men screaming and crying at a, a, you know, on a border because of something that they demand for their, for their daughter or their wife. Um, and I've, of course, seen many g- gatherings, as was spoken earlier, when you can find a safe place. Um, oftentimes, we have to gu- you know, put it in disguise, so we say it's a sewing group, or it's, a, it's something to do with a food program, so it seems, um, but it's a way to get the women together, so at least they are, they're not isolated, because being isolated is a part of the abuse often. Um, so, so the more we talk, the more we gather together, the more we give them safe, safe places. Um, and, and give opportunities for, for, to educate each other and to educate men and for growth. I wanna pick up on something that the special envoy just said. Um, when you have those countries that have these laws and policies that protect um, the violators of gender-based violence, how does UNFPA work with those countries or what type of programs do they put in place? I think, you know, as um, Special Envoy um, Angelina was just alluding to, the complexity of the problem can be really daunting and depressing. And we can't shy away from the fact that these are violations of human rights. For UNFPA, our agency actually works under the umbrella of UNHCR, the the Refugee Agency in Humanitarian Situations. In development situations, you know, regular trying to build up the economy, give a place to women and girls, looking at sexual and reproductive health and rights as an asset to a woman or a girl. The agencies that we ally with that are so important are UN Women and the development program, UNDP. Because this issue of gender-based violence is not an isolated one and it's not an easy one because obviously we would have solved it by now if it were. A lot of it has to do with the economic situation of that girl. Why are you in a position to be trafficked? Why are you uh, vulnerable? A lot of it sadly has to do with inequality in society and COVID is showing that very, very glaringly. So the solution side 
is to ensure, first of all, that women are not reticent. And the conspiracy of silence is actually pretty effective. If you don't believe you have rights, well, you're not going to claim them. So I think, you know, others have already spoken eloquently to that point. Representative Holohan, what would you like to see more done here in the U.S.? I mean, we have a huge domestic violence um, issues here as well. There's just so much to, to that answer. Um, I, I think that is one of the things that's, that I struggle with is that we somehow think that these are faraway issues, that they're not our issues. These happen somewhere in a land that is not ours. And, and rather we know that they're happening in our, in our homes and many of the nicest ones and some of the not so nice ones that this is happening. Uh, and so what I would say is that we, we need to have government that understands that uh, and I'm hopeful that in just 28 days, we might have that opportunity uh, to have kind of from top to bottom at the federal level, even some places at the state level, people who are working together to address the fact that from the very beginning, if you don't take care of women and girls, if you don't think of them as priorities uh, in your society, then your society will be weaker because of it. Uh, and you will be less secure because of it. So I, I think that I think you might be hearing my politics coming through, uh, that I think that there's an opportunity here in a little bit to be a more empathetic United States of America and more active for all player in the world. And Special Envoy, what are some other ways, I mean, you've had all these experiences and you've seen the issues firsthand when you're out in the field. How do you, in addition to politicians and uh, the UN, how do you communicate the uh, atrocities that you've seen around the world to the everyday person and, and get them motivated to also want to do something? Well, I wish I knew exactly what the, the best way to, to do that is. Um, I, I've spent, I, you know, I, I've been in the UN about 20 years and when I was first there, I did a lot of crying. I would just see people and I would cry and I didn't know what else to do. And this lovely grandmother once who was taking care of all the children who, who had, she'd lost her daughter and she'd taken, she, she looked at me and she said, I don't need you to cry, I need you to help me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and uh, you know, so, so I think we, you know, I wake up every day, just I try to understand what, what is happening. I try to, I tried to take myself, I, th I think the, the reality is we can care for each other and we can know it's right to see all, uh, all this world, all peoples, all genders as equal. But, but it's, it's that great saying, isn't it? It's not what you stand for, it's what you stand against sometimes that, that really defines you. And we are in a time we have to fight. There are certain things that are sliding back for children's rights, for women's rights, racial equality. It's, we, we are in a moment in history where we must fight for what we know um, is, is a fair and balanced and equal world where people are protected and who those who cause harm um, to others are held accountable. And if we don't, we're kind of moving a lot of pieces around, but we're not gonna get where we need to get. So I usually tell young people to try to educate them, themselves on their rights because um, they know morally in their heart what's right, but do they understand what uh, you know, how to fight the system a little and how to understand the system and how to survive the system. I think that's a really great way to end our discussion of, you know, encouraging people to educate themselves, know their rights, uh, and also to be advocates and speak up for, for people around the world um, and to understand that this is not just an issue in countries far away, but it's also an issue right here in the United States. So I just wanna thank you all today for, your, for being here and for being very passionate about um, wanting to inform people on gender-based violence and informing us what we can do. And I also just wanna address the viewers who may be thinking, how can we help? And, I have a way that they can help right now that I'd like to share with them because as Americans, they have the power, just like Special Envoy said, um, to understand the rights of women and girls and 
talk to their elected officials about how we need, they need to do more and we as a community need to do more in order to end gender-based violence. And we should be supporting UNFPA who is on the front lines providing access to critical healthcare and including gender-based violence uh, in, their, in their programming and, and wanting to eliminate it uh, and helping to counsel girls and women around the world. But unfortunately, the United States for the fourth year has failed to live up to its commitment to UNFPA by withholding life-saving contributions um, to, uh, to help the, the organization. So I want our viewers to let their representatives in Congress know that UNFPA is very critical to girls and, and women across the globe and urge them to help restore American support for this important organization. And they can do this. We have a very easy way by pulling out their phones right now when they watch this and text UNFPA to the number 30644 to let their Congress um, person know that this organization, UNFPA, needs to be supported. So on behalf of the United Nations Association of the USA, I just want to thank everyone once again for their participation, and I hope you stay well. Thank you.